So without further ado, we are going to talk a little bit about COVID-19, the coronavirus pandemic, trauma, and some of the mental health after effects. I, as I mentioned before, my name is Sue Breithaupt. I am a licensed clinical social worker and health educator with the Valley Hospital Department of Community Health and Community Benefit, and I oversee the Primetime Program. And with me today is my friend and colleague, Mason Jenkins. Mason? Hi, everybody. Nice to be with you all. Um, just as I was about to start speaking, like a uh, fire truck went by my apartment. I live in the Bronx, and so there might be some background noise coming from the street outside my window, and hopefully that will be minor, and I will mute when I'm not speaking. Hopefully that won't be a problem for anybody. My apologies. Um, Sue and I have opted to have the closed captioning on that sort of presented itself to us as an option. So uh, hopefully that works for people. Uh, if you're not able to have the volume on, uh, the, it, it appears to translate what we're saying into words on the screen pretty effectively. I would love it if somebody out there in the audience would put in the chat that you are able to hear us and see us uh, just, just fine. Um, we can't see you. Sue and I can only see each other yeah. and slides. Um, and so I would love to know that we're getting across to you. I can see that we have about uh, 16. 16 people on, but I'm not sure if I can see the chat coming from you guys. Um, I'm assuming everyone can hear us. Uh, I'm aware that we also told you that you could give us your questions and whatnot in the chat. And I'm not sure that that's the case because my chat is looking like it's only host and panelists, which is just you and I, Sue. So. Oh, okay. Uh, and I have mine up. So, okay, the chat is off, but I can see all and hear all fine. Someone said, we can hear you. Okay, oh. you guys are great. Thank you so much. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> you Thank know, you. I'll tell you, I just gave a lecture um, in person. I know Mason's done a couple of well uh, as well, and can't wait to get back out there and do it live. Right? <laughs> this is good, but we miss it. We were totally looking forward to being at the library with you guys. Um, so, but we're going to do the best we can here. Uh, so, just to be clear, we are not using the chat. We are using the question and answer. And Mac, Gail, and Denise, I appreciate you giving us your input there. You've helped to guide us along. This is a collaborative <laughs> venture we're engaged in here. Um, okay, so just to introduce myself, my name is Mason Jenkins, and I am in charge of spiritual care at Valley Hospital. And so it's uh, there's a lot that goes into that job, but taking care of the spiritual needs of patients and families at the hospital, as well as the emotional life of the staff that are there. Uh, that's been a big one over the last couple of years with COVID and the emotional toll that that's taken on, upon the staff. Um, I've done some, uh, some community events, uh, community education with Sue, uh, but a lot of my experience that I'm gonna be speaking from is you know, just coming from being a person living through the pandemic. Uh, and also coming from my experience in the hospital and seeing how, you know, this has all affected people. Um, I think that's uh, that's my intro there. Should okay. we go to the next slide there, Sue? Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure it's working. The uh, forgive me. Um, the the text is in front. Let me go here. All right. There we go. Okay. Onward. <laughs> yes, here we go. So already evident within our presentation is that the world is just not the same as it was a couple of years ago. Everything starts out with this awkwardness and these virtual formats, and it would be so nice to be together. And there have been a lot of in-person events, uh, so we would, we would lift that up as well. Um, but the starting place for us, the place that we're speaking from today is really that we have been all collectively as a culture, as a society, as a health system, 
uh, as human beings, we've been through just unimaginable stuff these last couple of years, right? Since March of 2020, when uh, COVID really exploded and everything got shut down uh, through the various periods of recovery and the various waves and the various vaccines and all that we've been through. Uh, it's, it's remarkable that we're still standing, that we're still here, that we still show up every day to our lives and that we have the energy and the wherewithal to just keep ticking, right? Uh, so it's a great testament to the resilience of human beings, how adaptable we are. Um, but so right at the start here, we just wanna lift up um, just what a hard couple of years this has been uh, in so many ways. And it's so personal for every single person. It's different what's been hard about it. Uh, it hasn't been exclusively difficult. There have been things that have worked well for people and a lot of learning, um, but it's been, it's been tough. And you might be familiar with these type of statistics, but according to the National Institute of Health, um, as of September, 2021, and we're probably, uh, I, I would think even more even than more recent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there are more recent data, uh, that, probably would also reflect the same trend, but that there's a 46% increase in symptoms of anxiety and a 33% increase in symptoms of depression. So um, that's big, you know, that's, that's a lot of us. That's probably many of us on this call. And even, a, even those of us who don't identify as people who, you know, have symptoms of depression or anxiety, um, it's, we have been impacted in ways that are noticeable and ways that we need to care for in order to, uh, you know, move ahead in our lives in a positive way. Right. Um, the American Psychological Association says that the U.S. has been in a mental health crisis since 2020. Uh, it's not difficult to imagine why they would say that. Oh, and what I have found personally, and what Sue and I have both found working with uh, folks in the hospital, in the health system, um, is that people's emotional, people's emotions are just really close to the surface, right? So where, whereas we used to ha have like uh, maybe a thicker skin, or we could go through our day without being so bothered with things, we're, people are kind of set off by small things nowadays. I find that in my home life, with my family. Uh, I find it sometimes on the road. Little frustrations bring up big feelings. Um, and that's uh, a result of two years of heightened tension, mm -hmm. uh, always being vigilant about how we protect ourselves. Um, and so that prolonged period of time is not our bodies are not meant to sustain mm -hmm. that level of tension, vigilance. And so it has, a, you know, as the st stats here are showing, symptoms of depression and anxiety would be the result of that, that prolonged period of time. And, and in addition, if I can interrupt you, Please. Mason, of course, what we're talking about this evening is a lot of people have reported um, what they would call symptoms, which we're going to get into in a moment, of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and this is basically a disorder in which a person has difficulty recovering after experiencing or witnessing terrifying events, overwhelming events. And that certainly has been true of the last two years. So what used to be like, we just, we just saw uh, the hurricane affect people. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of PTSD as a result of that. We are also experiencing that from this ongoing crisis. And that's what's happening now. And of course, we've lost, uh, we, people have died over the pandemic. So there's this grief uh, that's weighing upon us. It's collective, you know, maybe even if we haven't lost someone close to us, um, there's a lot of loss in the, in the culture, in our collective uh, consciousness. So all of that leads into there being just this tremendous uh, emotional aftermath uh, or what some people are calling the, the other pandemic. Um, so like what Sue was saying that, you know, that it's the phrase just occurred to me the the post-traumatic stress, the PTSD of the mundane, right? So there's this, like somebody 
grabs a door handle and then they cough and then you grab the door handle after them and now your mind is spinning and you're thinking about you know who you're going to see in the next two days and whether you're going to you know there's this our minds have been set up to um to be on high alert um and there's these difficult emotions that come along with what we've been through over the last couple of years which are sadness and fear and anger and these aren't emotions that are we're comfortable with. We we don't want to look at these things. Um, I know for a fact that uh, addiction recovery type places are overwhelmed with people coming to them right now because so many people who have so much sadness and fear and anxiety are turning to substances to help to get them through. Um, we know that social isolation has been a major impact uh, of the last couple of years and what that has led to is feeling of being lonely not having the same connections with people um, so it's really important that we try and counter some of these things that we recognize them um, sue's going to get into to that in a second so um, this difficulty sleeping is something we heard a lot uh, from healthcare workers throughout the pandemic that you're just on high alert all day and that when it comes time to lie down, your mind is, is still going. Um, and so that's something to be aware of. Um, and sleep deprivation combined with stress is a really bad combination for our overall health and well being uh, because so many of the systems of our body depend on sleep to recover and depend on a sense of equilibrium that comes from not being in a stressed state. So when our bodies are stressed, it puts all of the systems of our, of our body at uh, working harder. Um, we might have changes in appetite. Some of us are overeaters. Some of us are undereaters. Uh, that's something to be aware of. Um, you know, I know this next one, avoiding memories of the illness. Uh, there came a time when I just didn't want to hear any more news about the pandemic at all. Uh, we were living at the hospital, and I just didn't want to hear a thing about it. I was, um, and that's the normal reaction too, is just to want to hide your head in the sand and feel like that's enough already, right? Um, so we might we might have flashbacks or nightmares. You might be thinking about it while you're sleeping. Um, no, but it might not be that it's a nightmare about the pandemic, but it's that we have a lot of difficult emotions that we haven't really worked our way through yet. And that stuff plays itself out in our sleep. So you wake up and you don't know what it is, but you've got some sort of nebulous fear or, or sadness or anger uh, that comes out in your dream life because it can't come out in your day to day because we're culturally conditioned to be, you know, gentle or calm or, or whatever. Um, so there may be some guilt associated with surviving uh, if others died, particularly, you know, there's so much worry about spreading this illness to people that we cared for, you know, people that were compromised in our lives. Um, so we were vigilant and then, you know, inevitably people did get sick. And I know people occasionally would blame themselves and that's another difficult emotion that we have to come to terms with. And who can forget the fear of dying? Uh, that's sort of been hanging over us for the last couple of years. Uh, it's, a, it's a reality of being human, but we've really been face to face with it over the last couple of years. So this is the, this is the context we're coming at you from today is that there's all of this stuff. And the fact that you're on this call says to me that you are, you're willing to engage with some of these difficult emotions. I can't imagine you came on here thinking it was going to be, um, you know, uh, all feel good and rainbows. Uh, we are going to get to some some positive uh, tools and uh, some advice for how to cope with all this. But the first step, which Sue's going to get into now, is just to be aware of what we've been through and how that's affected us. Sue, you're on mute. Okay, no fire trucks here, but <laughs> didn't want to interrupt. Yes, Mason, thank you so much for all that. Um, absolutely, uh, 
you know, talking about some of the symptoms that you may have been feeling regarding whether it's PTSD or anxiety or depression or just so much stress, you know, we often feel, some people feel just a couple of those things. Some people have been feeling all of those things. They come and go. It's not always just linear. You know, it, it kind of, we've been all over the place, but never has coping been so important as really lately, the last couple of years. And of course it has to do with the pandemic, but if you think about the last two years, so many things have occurred, you know, just, I mean, we just experienced, like we said, you know, this often, like I said, this awful hurricane and there's, there's war and there's been political shifts and just so many different difficult things. So we, coping is extremely important right now. So just to get into it, I, I have this, um, this little sort of acronym, uh, the three A's that, that is, it's helpful for me to remember. It's been helpful for my patients too, to think about the three A's, which is our awareness, acceptance and action. And as Mason just said, you know, if, if we're not aware of a problem or that we're not feeling well, or if we're in denial, then we can't really do too much to um, improve the situation. Again, I'm probably preaching to the choir because you're here and you're willing to listen about this, but it has never been so important than to kind of tune into yourself. You know, how am I doing? How am I feeling? how have I been sleeping, even physically, because a lot of those, a um, lot of stress can pr um, present itself even through physical issues like backaches, stomach aches. We talked about insomnia. Um, physically, our bodies, you know, I, I love that there's a, there's a book out there called The Body Keeps the Score. Um, a, a, a Dutch psych, a psychologist by the name of uh, Bessel van der Kolk, Kolk um, wrote a book called The Body Keeps a Score, and really it has to do with just that, that trauma can present in our bodies very often. So it's never been so important then to be aware of, of how you're doing that way. Um, you know, so many people, if you think about any problem in our lives, but but uh, in our lives are, are but just like, I know so many people will say, well, you know, I'm just fine. I'm doing nothing. You know, it's okay. I handled it. I've been through worse. And then if you don't deal with your feelings, they deal with you. You know, so it's, it's just, again, this has been hard, like Mason said, and I've been responding to it like, well, what, you know, what, am I numb? Am I angry? Do instead of just road rage, do I have walk rage in the grocery store? Cause that's popular too, right? Am I more impatient? Um, and then, you know, once we're more aware of whatever the struggle is, you know, whether we're dealing with PTSD from all this or whatever the problem is, then we can work on accepting it, which is just as important. You know, um, historically, I think that, you know, in terms of any kind of treatment, even psychological, it's been really focused and it's great on well, what can we do to feel better right away, as opposed to just sort of sitting with whatever is going on and just being, being, you know, accepting that, it, that it's, that it's happening. And what do we do from there? I'm working with a man right now, pretty young guy, in my, my opinion, he's young, he's in his early sixties and he just had a stroke and uh, he's no, he's doing much better. He's going to be fine, but he's depressed as a result of it, which is completely understandable. It's really overwhelming. Um, but he just, he is in denial about how he's doing and it's preventing him from truly accepting where he is and taking the right action. So that's what this is, you know, um, awareness, accepting what's happening, where you're at, and then what can we do to manage all of this? You know, and there's a lot we can do, even if we're really struggling with PTSD or, or clinical depression or serious anxiety. And that's the good news. So these are just some ideas. Um, Mason and I, uh, I had the honor of being on a resilience team uh, the last two plus years since actually what April 2020 I think and um, we started pretty much at the beginning and what we did um, via this team you know what we did was we provided support to our healthcare workers to the staff of the Valley Health System who were so overwhelmed as you can imagine they were facing um, just trauma every day you know and so what we did is we, we worked with them and some of the things I'm going to talk about right right now are some ideas um, that helped people get through. And I think it can help us all. So we're just gonna, let me just make sure I can go to the next slide, it's tricky. Okay, there we go. <laughs> all right, so as I just mentioned, uh, I think that feeling our feelings quite quite uh, basically is, is very, very important, being aware of them and, and dealing with the sadness, with the anger, 
with the numbness, whatever the feelings are, you know, validate, as we said, that this time has and is a difficult one because it continues. It's much better than it was, but um, you certainly are not alone. Um, sitting with, with these feelings that arise, uh, very uncomfortable, really tricky. And I, I, you know, I've read so often, and I do believe that this is where addiction can come from too, as opposed to wanting to, to deal with whatever is upsetting us, you know, after a tragedy or just, you know, a breakup, whatever it is, you know, it, it's so much easier to maybe focus on something else, go shopping, have that drink, eat a lot of that food, you know, kind of escape, you know, we're wired like that. It's really hard to be human. It's really overwhelming, but just sitting with those, that difficulty, I just can't tell you how effective that is, you know, accepting it. It's here to teach you something. You will get through this too shall pass. Um, as I said, it accepts, you, you know, it helps to accept this grief, the loss. There's still a lot of changes we're going through. Some things are not going to go back to the way it was. Um, and it, I mentioned this too shall pass. It's a, it's a wonderful phrase. It's something that so many of my patients, um, you know, just, just, uh, they would continuously say this, you know, as a way to remember that this things will get better, any difficulty will. Um, and it kind of leads to a lot of self-reflection and wisdom. And that's something that I think uh, we've both Mason and I have seen a lot in, um, the people who, with whom we've worked, a lot of my patient is that, there's a lot of people that became very bitter and very angry and they're overwhelmed. And then there's been a lot of people that have learned a lot through this. They've tapped into their spirituality more. They've grown as a result of this. They've looked at, you know, relationships and changed, changed a lot. Little things are very important, you know, a lot of perspective and that, that's, that's ideal. You know, if, if you can get to so that. Point. If I could, the one thing I would say about this too, is that um, Difficult emotions are a part of what it means to be human, right? So part of the wisdom of this these last couple of years is recognizing that this is a this is a big part of our lives. Uh, there are, there's a lot of difficulty going on right now. So we can we can come to terms with those difficult emotions, or we can expend a bunch of energy trying to um, feeling badly about the way we're feeling or judging ourselves for feeling mm -hmm. uh, worn out or angry. Um, so we, uh, in the way that we react, we react to those difficult emotions, um, we can put another layer of difficulty and stress upon ourselves and upon the situation. Uh, so the, the idea is to recognize the emotions that arise without giving uh, a whole bunch of judgment on yourself, right? Because we're, we're conditioned to think that we should be a certain way and we should be able to handle things, you know, uh, we want to be capable, we want to be independent, we want to be strong, we want to, you know, these are all ideals that our cult culture really holds up. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is that we are human and we are frail and the world is difficult and we need each other. And so unless we can embrace that reality, uh, it's going to be a struggle. If we think that we're going to, we're going to stand on our own against all odds, um we're gonna we're gonna be um we're gonna have a hard time right you weren't kidding we need to be very compassionate with ourselves starting with ourselves that's really what it comes down to you know like mason said no judgment here you're not alone and the more you you work on this and face that um the more manageable it will become i worked with a woman years ago she dealt with she struggled for years with insomnia and uh, she had a very difficult time with sleep and a lot of it had to do with, with anxiety and angst. She just struggled every night. And one day I said to her, you know, as opposed to trying to think your way out of it or, or you know, do something to manage your insomnia, I want you just to, just to lay there with it. Just let the feelings come over you like a, like a, a wave. And uh, anyway, she started doing it. You know, she heard, she heard me finally. And then she started to... Uh, she embraced a lot of things and started to sleep better. So has its practical usages, which leads us to, you know, basically something that, uh, called cognitive restructuring, which is really just shifting one's thinking, you know, for as I am, as I think I am. And, um, you know, I think that identifying difficult thoughts, you know, our thoughts often come at us so, so quickly. There's so many pressured thoughts, especially these days with when you're feeling stressed and anxious. And it's very important to just even, like I said before, just be aware of some of your thoughts, 
be aware of what goes on. Great time to do that is when you wake up first thing in the morning. If you ever just kind of quietly listen to what's going on in your brain, be an observer, you'd be very surprised how pressured and sometimes how negative our thinking can be. So it's really, it's, it takes a lot of practice and it really is a skill. It's a lot of work, but to be able to identify the difficult thoughts, you know, oh, this will never pass. You know, this is terrible. This is awful. You know, um, the world is terrible, all those things. And, and some of it may be sort of true, but it's not helpful. <laughs> and it's just as true that the world is a wonderful place. And there's a lot that we need good. We need a good news station, right? <laughs> but there's a lot of wonderful things and things are, you know, we're not where we want to be right now, but we're not where you, we used to be back in 2020 around May or so. So um, just to be able to catch that you know, identify when you're tough on yourself. I shouldn't be feeling this way. What's wrong with me? Why am I so down? You know, everyone else is doing well. You know, just, okay, look, I'm having that thought. We're going to pause. We're going to take a nice deep breath. And then we're going to shift that a little bit. It's just as true that there's not that I, I do very well and I've gotten through very difficult situations and I will get through this too. It's just as true that things are better, that things are getting better, that things are shifting regarding the pandemic, at least. Very powerful and very simple, but profound, profound. Um, so then, like I said, you're, you're kind of trying to replace those thoughts. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a bit, um, but it's a practice. It is work, and I highly encourage it. You know, um, there's actually, it's been said that. Um, <clears throat> This type of, uh, of thinking, this, well, this cognitive restructuring is very helpful for people who are depressed. Because when people are depressed, their, their thoughts are very negative about themselves and the world. And one of, some of the work has to do with this. But if you can do it on your own, it's really worth it. That's, we're going to talk a little bit about journaling as a, as a way to help that along. Okay. So one of the things um, that's that I'm seeing right now is that as the world sort of returns to normal, um, people expect things to be the way that they were before, right? And I feel like this fall in particular, it's been particularly heightened because, you know, things at school are, are normal again for, for my children. And uh, there's a lot of sense of like, we're, we're back at it, we're, you know, and the fact of the matter is that things are, are not the same, that we are different, our world is different, we will never be the same, and we have to learn to live in the world that we're in, right? We can't be living in a world of five years ago, we can't be living in a dream world of, you know, of our own creation. Uh, so it's really important that we embrace the opportunity and the change that presents itself to us each day right something that you used to do that was meaningful to you perhaps when you laid it down and you stepped away from it you realized that it wasn't so meaningful and so now you need to find a way to you know figure out how to have social interactions with people you know maybe you lost touch with some folks when you were isolating over the pandemic and now you're not sure that that's a that those are people that you want to have in your life right and you have to find other places to to connect with people um this one's a little bit easier said than done. We're creatures of habits. We want things to be, you know, as we expect them. And, and particularly now with the last couple of years having been so unpredictable, it's, it's natural that we would think to ourselves, oh, finally, you know, I don't have to fill out that questionnaire every morning before my kids leave for school about their symptoms. They can just go to school, right? And yeah, like there's a relief in that. Um, but there are many things about our world that are not the same and that's okay. Nothing stays the same, right? The world is constantly changing. Uh, what we're faced with every day, we, we might think it's the same as the day before, but the, the world is ever new and we need to be, uh, in a state of, of curiosity in a state of openness to what the world has to offer to us. Sort of like beginner's eyes, right? Exactly. Again, easier yes. said than done. But even prior to the pandemic, there's so many studies that um, suggest people, especially as the age, people who are older, 
the happiest older people are those who are open to things changing, to being a little more flexible. And, and now, of course, that is true on many levels. You know, it's, it's so. So we're going to talk a little bit about something that, um, as I mentioned before, Mason and I were, um, we provided a lot of resilience uh, support, I guess, and, and support to our healthcare staff and our staff uh, during the pandemic. And um, one thing that we found was pot, was universally, uh, you know, something that people really responded, did well because of was connection, right? Our staff, every time, you know, we would talk a lot about what the challenges were, you know, what, what was going on and, and universally, a lot of people talked about insomnia, like we mentioned before, <laughs> that was a huge issue for most of our staff members. But conversely, what helped them through, we'd ask them at the end of each session, what, how are you doing? What's, what's helping you right now? They would talk about their peer support and connection. And it's true regarding our own coping as well. You know, I, I work with a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm not a joiner. I'm sort, sort of introverted. And I'll say to them, it does not matter. You know, whether it be me or another group or your friends or family, it's so important to make sure, you know, you realize you're not alone. Other people are feeling the same way and, and just the energy of other people helps us a lot. Um, this this slide, it, 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 it looks like hig, but it's actually pronounced Hoog. <laughs> this is a Danish concept, and it has to do with this very thing. Um, it has to do with connection. You know, they they uh, there was a study done. This is a while ago. It was you know they were kind of um, it was it was regarding the happiest countries in the world, and Denmark is one of the happiest countries in the world, which really seems strange because. I think it's what more than half the year it's it, it's you know very dark there it gets dark so early right it's so cold you know there, it's not the tropics how is that possible but one of the reasons that Denmark and a lot of the Scandinavian countries are so you know have so many people happy living ha happy people living in them is because they're they really encourage this idea of community of connection simple pleasures. We just see a picture there of a group of people sitting in the cold out in the snow around the fire. <laughs> and it has a lot to do with just slowing down. Um, I think about at the height of the pandemic in the spring, the summer, I remember, you know, again, we couldn't go many places. We were in lockdown, but how many people were outside in their driveways or on their balconies or on their stoops, like way back when, you know, connecting with each other, talking. You know, I, I remember my husband said to me, I feel like it's the 1970s again with all the kids on their bikes and families taking walks. And, and that's what sustained us for the most part. You know, it's certainly what sustained a lot of our staff and even myself, Mason, and our, our resilience crews that we had each other. So I, I, I really encourage, you know, that, you know, how we often say when we're, we have to do something social, oh, when I feel better, I'll go out and do it. But you have to do it or go out to feel better very often. So it's pretty- Let's say to the importance of just being physically in the presence of other people just cannot be underestimated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've, we've managed to do a lot of great stuff virtually. It's helped us to stay connected. Many of us have been able to work in that way. Um, but we are a tribal creature, right? Like the, the way these people are gathered around this fire, that is how our species developed. Our, our bodies are meant to be in proximity to other human bodies. And there is a wisdom in our bodies that knows, uh, senses when we are around other people that is, um, you know, we might not, maybe it's awkward. <laughs> maybe we're not, we can't remember how to be around other people. But just putting yourself in that position, just being around a table, just sharing a meal, um, it's an excellent first step. It's a it's a necessary step to what it means to be human and what it means to cultivate what's most important in our lives, uh, which is relationship and connection. Absolutely. Okay. On the other hand, <laughs> this, <laughs> dealing with challenging people. Okay. So what we've experienced quite a bit at the hospital, and I think in general, is we talk, as we talked about in the beginning, a lot of people, not all, but some people have, they, there's a lot of anger out there and patience. People are struggling, you know, and a lot of times I love the phrase hurt people hurt people, right? So there's, there's some of that. And, and I think that that 
that's just an just an important idea or something to keep in your mind when you're around people who can be sort of challenging. Um, but in general, especially with some of the holidays coming up and, and as we talk about trying to connect with others, you know, there's the idea of avoiding those types of people, which some people, they wanted, they, they, they're doing that a little more often these days. If I think, um, you know, we put into perspective uh, who we want to be with and connect with in our lives. But, you know, if, you know, those challenging people are close to you, your family members, people you work with, people you're going to see at the holidays. You know, I throw this in here because uh, I think it can be helpful to know how to deal with people like that. So, so you feel, you feel better, you know, it's really difficult to be around um, challenging people. There's many out there. So, you know, if you do have to connect, remember to avoid hot topics. Um, I think these days, especially, you know, making sure we don't, ch you know, challenge a person to see your point of view, you know, it, it's, it's, it feels very compelling to do that. Um, usually does not work out very well. Um, most people just really want to be heard. You know, we've had a lot of people, even at the hospital, been a lot of complaints, as you can imagine. It's been a very difficult time. People are, were short-staffed, so many different issues. And I will say that when, you know, when we just listen to somebody and their complaints, that goes a long way. And that can be true with personal relationships. Um, someone's being very negative, maybe someone in your family, um, a way to kind of keep your serenity is just to change the subject and redirect things, you know? Um, can be very helpful. But if you do feel very strongly about something, you know, you can speak up in a very respectful manner. And, uh, and again, like I said in the beginning, maybe right now is not, if you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, a little more anxious, struggling right now, you may want to minimize time with challenging people. But if you have to be around them, these are just some ideas because that really can affect our mood, especially these days. A couple of thoughts here too, Sue. One is to just set your expectations up in advance. Yes. Uh, just recognize if you're going to a, a family gathering and there's somebody there that gets under your skin, just be easy with yourself. Don't, don't blame yourself for getting frustrated with that person. Uh, that can, like I say, that can add to the emotional strain of it. So set the expectation. Um, and then when you're in the presence of somebody that is difficult or somebody that you don't necessarily get along with, I encourage you to think about uh, things that you might have in common, find things that you have an affinity for. Uh, we so often focus on the things that we disagree about or the thing about, a, about that person that really drives us crazy. And I, I think the, the fundamental nature of being human me is that we have a great deal in common and our minds sort of trick us to think that we are so different from other people who hold other ideas or believe such and such a thing. Uh, but at the, a very basic level, we have a great deal. We have things in common with even people that we disagree with. And to, to lift those things up rather than lifting up the things that we disagree about uh, can be healing and can help us to feel better about the time together. It keeps us calmer. I remember, uh... I was working with um, somebody, this actually a physician had said to me, you know, one of the things that's helpful for a lot of my patients is when someone's being very difficult and you have to deal with them to see the letters ill or sick across their foreheads. <laughs> you know, it just kind of invokes a little bit of uh, compassion and it, it, you know, can help a little bit with dealing with them. Stillness and breath. Mm -hmm. Uh, ironically, I, I have a car alarm going on. I don't know if you can hear it, but as so there it, it goes off. Um, so this is one of those actions. We've talked about how we uh, acknowledge what's going on, the emotions that we're feeling, what the condition is in our body, uh, accepting those things, being gentle with ourselves. Um, and this is one of those actions that we can take that can help us to come to terms with difficult emotions, to live with them, to move past them without ignoring them. Um, so there's many different ways that people talk about this. We might talk about mindfulness or meditation, uh, but basically being still, setting your device aside and focusing on your breath for any amount of time is going to improve your sense of well-being. Now, in the slide, we're recommending starting with five minutes, working up to 30 minutes. 
30 minutes is a long time to sit quiet. Um, you know, so even 30 seconds, 10 breath, counting to 10 breathing, you know, in one, out two. Uh, it doesn't cost anything. You could do it while you're driving. You can do it while you're trying to get your kids to go to sleep at night. Um, and it does a couple of things. When we focus on the breath, it helps to turn our attention inward and it tunes us into our body. And when, when there's something in the world that's frustrating us, our impulse is to want to fix it or control it or change it, right? We want it to be out here so that we can see it and we can alter it so that it's no longer such a problem for us. But the reality is that the things that trouble us, they, they live in our bodies and they manifest themselves in our bodies. So if we can take our focus away from fixing something that's in front of us and acknowledging how it impacts us in our body, then we can tune into what our body is telling us, what we need, that we need more sleep or we need food or we need you know, rest or we need you know, whatever it is. Um, we have a tendency to be holding our phone and to have our attention out here in the world all the time and to think this is where all the information that we need comes from. But the fact of the matter is our body processes all of these emotions we're dealing with all of the stimulus that we're getting out outside in the world, it comes through our body. So if we can breathe, uh, we can be still, we can tune into our body, and we can start to receive a little bit of information that it might be providing to us, um, which might, you know, it, it, it might not be so clear cut as, you know, an email or a text or, you know, however else you might get your information. But there is information that our bodies can provide to us. Uh, that it will benefit us to tune into and to listen to. Um, so being still, uh, practicing deep breathing uh, can help us to tune into our bodies. Um, so this is something I've, we've been talking a lot about throughout the pandemic, which is is three good things. So this is this is a type of gratitude practice. So it's common knowledge that it's to be to have gratitude, to express gratitude, to write a list of things you're thankful for. These are these are good good things, right? They can be good for you. Um, but uh, or I guess early on in the pandemic, I came across this practice of three good things and found that there's actually a, a pretty substantial amount of like evidence based research uh, that demonstrates uh, that this practice is um, has a big impact on our mental well being. Uh, and so let me just tell you a little bit about it. So our minds are hardwired to pick up on threatening or negative things in our environment. And especially with the pandemic, things that are a threat to us or things that might get us sick, we've got all these alarm bells going off. And those alarm bells are forming pathways in our brain and training our brain to alert, alert, alert whenever something is a threat, right? And now there's a benefit to that. We need those, uh, as far as the evolution of our species, the sur our survival, we need to be on high alert when there's something which is a threat to our survival, right? That makes sense. What, 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 what happens, however, is that positive things, things that are not a threat to our survival, they get drowned out, they get squashed out and they leave our consciousness. Now, here we are, we're two years plus into the pandemic or, I guess it was March, 2020. All right, so we're almost two years into the pandemic and we do not need to be on high alert anymore, right? Now we might need some awareness of our surroundings and our, you know, whatever precautions we are comfortable with taking, but it's really important that we start to tone down that high alert stress res response and tone up the simple pleasures of our lives that are there every day that the pandemic has caused to be drowned out. So what three good things is, is that at, at the end of the day, you sit down, you lie in bed, and you reflect back on three good things that happened during the day. It could be a good conversation you had with somebody. It could be a walk you had that made you feel good. 
It could be a song that came on the radio. It could be that somebody you lost a long time ago came to your mind and then brought a sense of joy to your heart, right? So what happens is if you bring those things to mind, particularly at the end of the day, uh, the emotion that's associated with those good things, that conversation you had earlier in the day that brought some joy or love to your heart, the emotion associated with that conversation is brought to your mind again. The chemicals that are released in your brain when you have that, that loving connection with somebody, they're released once again as you revisit it mentally. So it reinforces the positive, uh, the positive things that are coming from those things that are happening in your life. Um, so in order to make it even more effective, what is something good that happened today? And what was my role in bringing that thing about? How did I impact the world for the better today? So it's simple. It's rather than just saying it was a beautiful day outside, that, that could be a good thing. You could say to yourself, it was a beautiful day. And I took a minute when I was walking to my car to look up at the sky and to, to feel the wind on my face. You took that moment to stop and sort of recognize, okay, there's goodness in the world and it is connected to who I am and how I bring myself to my life. So if you can do that, and so the research uh, that came out of the Duke Center for Spiritual, for Health and Duke Center for Healthcare, Safety and Quality, um, it was primarily done with healthcare workers and they did this three good things over a period of two weeks. So each night, uh, they had folks, I think, write down to be extra sure that they were doing the thing. Uh, and so just doing this for two weeks um, had substantial benefit uh, to feelings of depression, uh, poor work-life balance, uh, anxiety. All these things got better, improved, and not just for the two weeks, but six months into the future and a year into the future on par with with, with antidepressant medications. So a lot of us take SSRIs, antidepressant medications, because the world is hard and because we're sensitive and whatever the case may be. Now here, we, we have the power to impact the way we think about the world by lifting up positive things in our consciousness, ruminating upon the emotion that's associated with them, creating new pathways in our brain, and then therefore creating more and more positivity in our lives. Um, so I really recommend this to you that it can have, here we have listed like really a bunch of physical repercussions of, um, mm -hmm. of, this, of this practice. It's worth looking into just Googling it. Three good things. Duke University. It's fascinating. Really fascinating. Long-standing effects. Something so simple, right? <laughs> I've got an alert that comes up on my phone every evening at seven mm -hmm. uh, that tells me it's a, it's a three good things app. And so I just click on it and it takes me to a place where I can type these things in. Now I've learned from myself that seven o'clock is not a time when I have the wherewithal to write three good things because <laughs> I'm feeding my children or whatever the case may be. I need to, I need to reset my timer for like 8.30 for like when the, when the kids are wound down and I've got a moment to myself. Um, but this is a practice that we're, I'm recommending every time I speak to anybody about resilience. Uh, potentially has a, a really beneficial impact. The long and the short of it is there's good stuff in our lives every single day. And we're wasting our lives if we don't lift those things up, notice them, just appreciate them. I don't want right. to say your lives. That sounds kind of brutal, but that's... <laughs> it's true though. And it helped. This was very, very beneficial for a lot of our extremely stressed healthcare workers who were walking into trauma every day. So we highly recommend it, something that's uh, been effective. So, and along those same lines, um, something that we've also found to be very, very helpful to manage some of these overwhelming feelings, some of these feelings of extreme stress and trauma is to simply journal along the same lines, you know, to journal down, you know, to write down those three good things and, and how you induce them, you know, and, and what was your role in, in, in inducing those things um, or whatever's on your mind. Uh, we've actually, um, there's been some um, some research and and actually um, some people some different healthcare systems have encouraged their workers who went through so much to you know to write down what they went through and submit some of those works or it just it's very very helpful and it's a great release especially before bed to write down what's ever on your mind 
you know, to keep track of it. You know, journaling is extremely effective. I remember another woman I worked with many years ago, um, she had a, a, another very tough time with sleeping. And what she would do every night, as opposed to journaling, she had a, like a, a tin can, like a tin a tin box that she would, you know, when you put your store cookies in around the holidays, perhaps. And every night before she went to bed, she'd write down what was aggravating her. It was very often her daughter-in-law. It was very funny, but she would write down on strips of paper, whatever it was, was on her mind. And then she'd put it into the box. She called it her God box. And anyway, it helped her over, over a couple months. She started to sleep through the night, but it's just very, very effective. And it's also a good way to keep track of your growth. You know, just to go, wow, I was really struggling with this A, B, and C a few months ago, and now that's better, or I'm on to something else. And again, like I said, regarding our some of the healthcare workers writing out what was going on for them, it can be a creative process, which also helps. So uh, other things that we found very effective when we've asked our, asked our staff or what we've read about to help people with a lot of these difficult feelings, exercise, movement. If you don't like to do that particular exercise, don't do it, but whatever you like to do, do that dance, walk, you know, martial arts, whatever you enjoy. Um, as I mentioned, creativity, that's extremely, that's very helpful. There was a lot of people through the pandemic that you read about that actually kind of started painting, you know, maybe sculpting, got involved with, you know, writing or whatever it was. And um, creativity uses different parts of the brain that can evoke positive uh, responses. You always hear about very often about meditation, you know, that just what Mason was doing with you before we sort of just focus on your breath and it, you know, it can um, reduce your heart rate, you know, reduce your blood pressure, you know, all those very beneficial things. So much my, so many, so much regarding the mind and body, right? The healing, you know, we really have that power within us. Um, yoga, I know you've heard about that too. You know, I work at the Lifestyle Center, which is Valley's gym up in Mawa. It's a lovely facility. And of course, you know, they focused on the basketball court and all the wonderful equipment. And we have all that. We have three pools. The most popular uh, class here at the gym is yoga. And they started Tai Chi, which, which are all mind, body, ways for us to calm our systems down, to calm ourselves. So very, very popular, so very needed and helpful. one again and if you need extra support there's nothing wrong with that so what i love that expression one of our nurses always says that no if, what you know so so what you know you, you need you need to go to a counselor you need to talk to someone it's not a big deal so important if you're finding that you know you're trying everything you can to um, manage some of your symptoms of anxiety extreme stress ptsd so you go talk to, maybe you start with a, a rabbi, priest, pastor, um, trusted friend. Maybe you just try a couple support groups. There's so many online right now. And so what if you need counseling? Again, one of the positive things that, that came out of the pandemic was that uh, virtual assistance is, is very popular right now. If you're not so inclined to go see somebody to talk to with, but it, it is available. There's a lot of, lot of really good therapists out there that can help. And even if you have to go to your doctor or even a psychiatrist to get medication to get you through, it's okay. It's been rough. Don't be hard on yourself. That self-compassion is so incredibly important. Really encourage it if you need. No, it's almost vogue now. <laughs> And again, a word about habits and change. You know, we've talked a lot about th different things tonight. We've mentioned a lot of different things. Take what you like and leave the rest, first of all. You know, even if you pick up just a couple things and you sort of make it a habit, you know, you do, maybe you start journaling or you do the three good things. You start that and you do that for a few weeks until it becomes a habit. You will see a change. You just remember that. But if nothing changes and nothing changes, so you have that power. Um, so I think what I would like to say in closing is, you know, above all else, we really need to be kind to ourselves and we need to be kind to one another. It's, it's just been a horrible couple of years in so many ways. Um, so I think it's really fantastic that you guys turned out for this talk uh, and to listen to Sue and I talk to you about our experience with supporting people through all this. Um, you know, we are, we are all human and it's okay to struggle 
and it's okay to not struggle to feel joyful and to feel excellent about your days. Um, but we really need each other. I think we've learned uh, uh, from the pandemic that being isolated from one another is not, it's not good for us. And as a lot of us pulled back from the world and now we're, we're re-entering it, we have a slightly different set of priorities. Um, and I just really encourage you to make caring for yourself uh, in a loving way, in an accepting way for whatever you're going through, uh, just to make that a priority. Uh, to look around you and to see that there's goodness and that there are uh, people that are loving and caring uh, it's, it's all about your perspective, right? Like if you expect to see a bunch of jerks out in the world, you're going to see a bunch of jerks out in the world, right? Uh, but if you expect to see people caring for one another, uh, doing the best they can, um, you're going to see those people. They're, they're out there, right? We're all both of those people, in fact. <laughs> so let's lift up what's good. Let's try and uh, improve the world that we live in by caring for ourselves, starting with our bodies, our creatureliness, and supporting one another. So you got any closing words for us? So I just want us all to take a nice deep breath in through our nose. We're going to do four, five, six breathing, and I'll help you sleep tonight. Breathe in slowly to a count of four through your nose. One two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, slowly breathe out through your mouth, four, five, six, just one more time, nice, let's count to four in through your nose, hold, three, four, five, slowly breathe out, Three, four, five, six. Just let it all go. We want to thank you for being with us this evening. It's a real credit to yourself to uh, to look at this stuff and to want to make some changes for yourself and others. So 